This is a very spectacular Walbury Hill Fort. I came here a few weeks ago to walk to the trick point that's up there in the middle of the hill, but I couldn't because what was once permissive access is no longer. So I noted on my OS map that there's a bit of open access land to the south and perhaps I could get round from that direction. I came across came across that it's really not private here now at this point you guys would normally type in the comments below we just ask the landowner for permission to walk across here he'd give you permission and I'm sure he probably would but it turns out finding out who owns that piece of land isn't as easy as you think well such was the difficulty in finding out who owns England I thought I'd speak to a man who knows quite a bit about it to the point he's actually written a book how are you doing? All right. Hi there, nice to meet you. Hi, um, hi I'm Guy Shrubsall. I'm an environmental campaigner and author, and I wrote a book called Who Owns England, which is an investigation into land ownership in this country. Okay, so my goal is to find out how quick and easy it is to find out who owns that bit of land and how easy it is to ask them if I can just go for a walk there and take a look at the historic monument that that is, that hill fort. The way in which land ends up being registered is if it passes uh, from one owner to another via a market transaction. Now there are loads of bits of land in England that have been owned by the same people for hundreds and hundreds of years and they're just inherited by other family members. There are people who, you know, families who have owned land in England since the Norman Conquest. Some of that is down to, some of the fact that land isn't registered is down to the fact that we have this very, very ancient system of land ownership. Okay, official official title register 1495 plus VAT, 17 pound 94 fee. This could become quite an expensive hobby. So it's ridiculously hard to find out who owns land in England. Uh, it's one of our biggest, deepest, darkest secrets as, as a nation. Um, there is this body, the land registry, which is meant to have a record of who owns all the land in England and in Wales as well. It has 24 million registered land titles. You have to pay three pounds to see a single land title. So that's fine if you only want to look up who owns, you know, a field here or a moorland there. If you try to find out the answer to who owns all of England, you're paying 72 million pounds <laughs> and Wales as well, obviously, but you know, that's, that's like, more than, more than I have <laughs> to be able to investigate this as a hobby. And actually, also, the land registry isn't actually complete. It's been around since 1862, but it still hasn't finished the job of registering all the land in England and Wales. So only about 83, 85% of land is actually registered. Now, by and large, in this country, the land needs to be managed in an accountable way on a significant scale for food production. I think that's pretty clear. But that's often where there is the, uh, the first point of division, a perceived battle between the walker or the rambler, someone that wants to explore, and the, the land being worked for food. When, in my mind, that image needs to change because there is no real desire to just walk straight across that field right now if there was a right to roam. The perceived battle between the farmer over there reaping in his crop, ploughing the land thereafter, that doesn't really exist in nine out of ten times in my experience. So what I'm really trying to say there is this is how the argument is framed. If there was a right to roam, are you really going to walk across all of those crops just because you now have the right of access? Of course you aren't, and I am pretty confident the farmer doesn't believe that will happen too with something like the right to roam or the right to responsible access. But that is how the argument is framed between those two different parties. Let's delve deeper and explain what we mean. So I, I just got really intrigued by this question of who owns land, and then I started on to discover how difficult it was to find out who owns land in England. I sort of thought, what have they got to hide? You know, you look at something like who owns companies. Uh, since 2012, Companies House, that's all been open. You don't have to pay any money to find out who owns a company. Who owns land is a totally different matter. It's kind of surrounded by this sort of mist, this fog of secrecy. And that's something that I found really intriguing because it's all bound up with wealth and power and protecting that wealth and power. So I started delving into it, started investigating it, started to try and find other ways to uncover who owns land without having to pay loads of money to the land registry. And 
started a blog, whoendsengland.org, and then that turned into a book. Yes, yeah, still trying to answer that question, but ultimately it's a question that the UK government could answer very easily just by opening up the land registry and making it free for people to use, just as they have done with Companies House. So back to this plot of land here in the, uh, the North Hampshire Downs, sort of the border between Hampshire and Berkshire. What else can we do to find out who owns this plot of land? There are other ways to find out who owns land and, and the broad brushes of the picture, I've been able to kind of find out from other data sets or proxy sources of information. And I can say pretty confidently that less than 1% of the population own half of all England. And that's a staggering level of inequality of ownership. And that's another reason why I think it's really interesting to investigate this. So there's this act called the Highways Act 1980. Very boring, unless you're into transport planning. And there is a clause in it, section 31.6 of the Highways Act, which allows landowners to register their estate with their local council if they want to protect it from future rights of way claims. In other words, they're saying, this is my land, here's where the existing footpaths and rights of way are over it. I don't want to allow any more to be created through people's customary use of the land. On every local authority website, there are all of these maps of estates that have done this, have gone through this process. And so I've got hold of loads of them. I've got hold of them for West Berkshire. In fact, West Berkshire Council had very handily digitized all these maps. So it was actually really easy to then like analyze it, look at the area of land that each of the landowners own and work out that 30 of them own half of the whole county. <laughs> so let's have a look at the map for the area that we're stood in today. Who owns Walbury Hillfort and that surrounding area? Now Guy's, Guy's map states it's the Kirby House Estate. Now the land title seems to be registered under a company called Walbury Hill Properties. Now when you go on Company's House, well, I can't find that company, maybe it's not trading. Either way, in the news there's an article from the, uh, the Independent which states that the Astor family purchased this property in the 1950s. Okay, so if we can't find out using that, well, we can perhaps look at the environmental stewardship records. What exactly are they? Another way to try and find out who owns land in your area is to look at the farm payments, the farm subsidies that many farmers and landowners get from the government. In particular, there's been a scheme called environmental stewardship that has run in the past. It doesn't actually run now anymore. There's, there's a whole new system post-Brexit. But you can still use it. You can still access the data online, the maps. Uh, and often that will give you a clue as to who might own the land. So that's something else I've tried to do on Who Owns England is to take some of these maps, investigate the kind of people who are um, receiving the public money, the, the farm subsidies, and then trace back through sort of companies or other individuals who own who might own that land. Now the environmental stewardship maps show this place to be run by a company called Lily Farms Limited. And when you search for those, there are some Asta family members in there. All good, all above board, but this is where my trail kind of stops because from what I can tell from the research, it looks like the ultimate holding company is Riviera Holdings Limited and they're registered in the Bahamas. Firstly, I just think it's really odd, isn't it? Just to think that there are chunks of England that are basically owned in the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands, probably to preserve the identity of the ultimate owner. Um, a lot of these offshore jurisdictions, places like you know the Channel Islands, uh, the you know the British Virgin Islands, they're sort of quite notorious for having um, you know companies that are based there. Uh, perhaps because of you know uh, the company law in those countries allowing greater secrecy about who the ultimate owners are. Perhaps also because those jurisdictions have favourable tax regimes. But we can of course only speculate about the reasons for why an individual or company might be based in those countries, but it certainly raises some interesting questions about what's going on. Okay, so if we think that's unique, why don't we try scrolling up to the next parcel of land that guys mapped to the northwest of where we are, just a couple of miles by the looks of it, and we've got a piece of land, quite a significant chunk of land, owned by the Hungerford Park Estate at Hungerford. When we go onto Guy's website, he's already done the research for us, and it looks like their company is registered in Luxembourg. Why would you have a company registered in Luxembourg? So we, you know, often politicians will sort of say, ah, oh, we live in a property-owning democracy, everybody's got this dream of home ownership. Homes and domestic gardens take up 5% of England. Who owns the other 95%? That's the interesting question for me. You know, the stats that I've presented in my book is that 
rough estimate, 30% of England still belongs to the aristocracy. You know, a big chunk also belongs to what I sort of refer to as new money. There's about 18% owned by companies, both those registered in the UK and those registered in other countries, offshore, overseas countries. Uh, you know, all of Middle England, if you like, people who are lucky enough to own our own homes. That's the tiny amount of land that we ultimately own is vastly outweighed by a few thousand dukes and barons and members of the aristocracy. I'm fortunate enough to own my own home. I've got a little garden. That will do me nicely. I don't really crave for much else. I don't crave to own vast swathes of the land. I guess my desire would be to be able to access the land a bit more and go and see some of these ancient landscapes that are currently just sort of blocked off by big swathes of estates, including the one where he started this video. So what is the solution if we had a wish list? This inequality of land ownership, what's the overall goal from a point of view where I don't really desire to own a great deal else. We live in a democracy. I think it would be great if we had more democratic say over how our land's used and also had more uh, access to it as well. I'd love us to have a community right to buy here. Scotland has enjoyed a community right to buy for the last 20 years. It's led to thousands of communities across Scotland beginning to own land collectively. I'd love there to be a right of responsible access to the English countryside. We only have access, uh, we only have a right to roam over about 8% of it currently. Um, yeah, I'd like land to be used better for the good of us all and for the good of the environment, the good of nature. So I think things like uh, having a land use framework for England, that's, that's something that the new Labour government is discussing bringing in. A couple of things I want to make really clear about this video. Number one, if you own a company in this country, well then you should absolutely pay tax in this country. This is a YouTube channel, it pays tax in this country. I'm not going to set up Paul Whitewick Inc, stick it in the Bahamas or Luxembourg and hope for some uh, tax-free um, dividends or whatever you would do to save tax. Number two, if you receive subsidies from the land of the environmental stewardship in this country, well again you should pay tax in this country. Number three, this isn't a, uh, a bash at every single farmer. Far from it. I know at least a dozen and they're all lovely people that do everything in the way that I do. This really is what Guy has uncovered with the, some of the larger estates that go back quite a long way and how they operate their land. And at the worst case, well, it needs more questions answered. Number three, this isn't really a sort of a, a entitled rant. I don't want to own a whole bunch of land. This isn't me saying I own that tiny bit, I'd like to own my fair share. Far from it. This is me saying that I would like to see this land managed in a way that benefits all. Yes, food production, security of land, hugely important, but the vast swathes of estate land, what are we doing with those and how does that benefit everybody? Guy puts it a lot more eloquently than I ever could. Speaking of Guy, one more word from him. So as Paul mentioned, I've actually written a whole book about this called Who Owns England? And you can find out loads in it about land ownership and who owns land in your area. And you can uh, get that book by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks for joining us today, Guy. Real pleasure to have you along. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to know more about uh, land reform and the right to roam and what it would look like, you need to watch that video just there. Guy, you can, you can click it. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? In your area. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>